Several weeks ago, we started a new series of messages that we're calling uh, Survival Guide for Your Soul. And we're talking about how we can be healthy on the inside and not just have a healthy body physically, but have a healthy soul on the inside. And to do that, we're looking to the Psalms of Ascent, as Seth just sang a second ago in that song that we sang reminding us of these Psalms. These are a particular section of the book of Psalms from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134 as the children of Israel would make the ascent into Jerusalem three times a year for those special feasts and uh, they would sing these songs and celebrate uh, the goodness of God. And so today we're going to be in Psalm 126. So if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it and uh, you can go ahead and find a seat this morning. Psalm 126 is where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the seat back in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, that Bible is our gift to you. You can take that home. And uh, most of the verses will be on the screen as well today. But Psalm 126 is where we're going to be. The Bible says this. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. How many of you believe today that God has done great things for us today? Aren't you thankful for that? Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Today, for a few minutes, I want to speak to this subject. I must be dreaming. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, I must be dreaming. Let's have a word of prayer together. God, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this time that we can come together to worship you, to lift up your name. And Lord, for this time that we can look to your word and uh, that we can be encouraged and challenged and inspired through your word today. God, we recognize that as we look at the current landscape of our culture, our country, our nation, that often we can be discouraged. We can see the turmoil, the division, the vitriol. But God, I pray that we would understand that your word promises that we can have a peace that passes understanding, that we can find strength and comfort for our souls through the word of God. And so today I pray that we would have a holy focus on your word. I pray that we can be encouraged and challenged in our time together. We love you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, for as long as I can remember, I've been a fan of the Los Angeles Lakers. Ever since I was little, I've been a Lakers fan, and uh, my parents raised me right, and so now I'm raising my children right, and uh, we are fans of the Lakers. And my favorite player since I've uh, been a child has always been Kobe Bryant. Kobe was my favorite player, my favorite player all time. And I remember several years ago, back in uh, 2009, 2010, my brother Larry uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, he had to go through chemotherapy treatments. And I remember when those treatments were coming to an end, my dad wanted to celebrate the end of those treatments by taking my brother Larry and me to a playoff Laker game. And so we were excited about this. We're going to go to a playoff Laker game and have a great time together. And uh, we showed up at the arena, and uh, there was a CBS truck that was out front. And there was a reporter kind of walking around. And uh, we ended up talking to that reporter, and he kind of heard our story a little bit, heard about how my brother was battling cancer, and he decided to interview my brother during one of the commercial breaks of the playoff game. And as a result, we got to kind of go down near the court. We even got upgraded seats, and we got to sit courtside at a Laker playoff game. Now... For me, that was a dream come true. It does not get any better than that. Uh, my life was complete, being able to sit courtside at a Los Angeles Lakers game. And I remember I was so excited and just smiling ear to ear the whole night. And uh, before uh, the Lakers players came out for warm-ups, uh, I knew that they were going to run out of the tunnel. And so I went and kind of stood by the tunnel, and I saw them running out, and I saw Kobe coming. And I thought, there he is. There's Kobe, and he, he came running by. So I stood, stood, uh, put my hand out there, and he gave me, he gave me a high five. And I looked at my hand, I thought, I'm never washing you ever again. And uh, this was a dream come true. I got to go and experience that Laker game. It felt too good to be true. Now, on a much more significant and much more spiritual level, that is the sentiment of the psalmist in the psalm that we just read in Psalm 126. 
He says, man, I'm thinking about the goodness of God and the grace of God, and I'm overwhelmed. It's almost too good to be true. In fact, in verse number one, he says, it's like we are those that dream. I must be dreaming. As I consider the goodness of God and the grace of God, the children of Israel, they were overwhelmed. They were astounded at how good God has been to them. They said, we are those that that dream. Uh, There was a time in the New Testament when Peter was put in prison and uh, James was just beheaded and the early church was experiencing some persecution and they put Peter in prison and uh, they wanted to kill him next and the angel of the Lord came in, the angel uh, uh, set Peter free, broke him out of prison and uh, as this is happening, it's a really fascinating story in Acts chapter number 12, as this is happening, the Bible says this in Acts 12 verse number 9, and he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, uh, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. And so while this was happening, Peter was like, man, this is crazy. I must be dreaming right now. He thought that he saw a vision, and uh, he thought, man, this is, this is too good to be true. A few verses later, the Bible says that Peter came to himself, and he pinched himself, and he realized this is not a dream. This is a reality. Uh, God really did just set me free from prison. My chains really are on the ground. And Peter was overwhelmed at the goodness of God. And I happen to believe today that there ought to be some followers of Jesus in 2022 that would consider that our chains have been left behind and that we have been set free from the bondage of our sin and we have been set free from the slave market of sin and that we have this freedom in Christ Jesus and that should produce within us some some joy and to be overwhelmed at how good God really is. I must be dreaming because God has been so good to me, this was the sentiment. This was the feeling uh, that the children of Israel had in Psalm 126. The reality is, though, often because of sin, because of lust, because of greed, because of pride, we are often blinded to the goodness of God. We often forget about how good God has been in our lives. Peter, he knew how good God was to him and set him free from prison. And uh, he wrote in his letter to the churches that were scattered throughout Asia Minor. Peter wrote this in 2 Peter 1, verse 9. He said, but he that lacketh these things... Now, these things, if you read in context, Peter was talking about things that you can add to your faith. And so he's talking about love and goodness and kindness. And he's saying, add these things to your faith. But if you lack those things, so if you're not exemplifying those things, uh, you are blind and cannot see afar off. And hath, watch this, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. That you come to a place in your life when you're not living according to God's design. You're not living according to God's word. And you come to a place where you forget that you have been forgiven and cleansed of your old sins. He says, forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Uh, Peter says, if you want the assurance of your salvation, uh, make sure that you are living according to Scripture and doing the things that God wants you uh, to do. Uh, But don't come to a place in life when you uh, fail to be cognizant of the goodness and the blessings of God. Uh, I want to encourage you, don't come to a place where you uh, lose consciousness of the gospel message where you lose your wonder, your sense of awe about the good things that God has done. Uh, In the 1800s, there was a boy named Charles Gabriel, and uh, he was from a a small town in Iowa. He was overwhelmed at how good God had been to him and uh, the goodness of God in his life. And uh, he had a passion for music, but uh, even more than that, he had a passion for uh, Jesus. And he wrote down this song, uh, these lyrics, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary, and he suffered and died alone. He was amazed at the goodness of God amazed at the fact that God would redeem his soul. Uh, That boy was so amazed and so astounded at God's goodness, he went on to write 8,000 more hymns. 8,000 songs. That is a life of someone that just couldn't get over what Jesus had done for him. I wonder today, does God still amaze you? Or have you become desensitized to the power and the wonders of the gospel? Does God still amaze you? Does God still overwhelm your soul? Uh, Does does God still uh, speak to you through his word? Are you gleaning the things that God has for you? We come to Psalm 126, and this was the state of the children of Israel. They had to pinch themselves. It's like we're dreaming. God has been so good to me. I, I believe that this is the way that God wants us to live. I believe that God wants us to live the dream, uh, the best life possible. Uh, I love uh, Brian Hunter, our lead usher. Let's give it up for Brian. Uh, Looking at him a second ago. And many times I'll ask Brian on a Sunday morning, hey, Brian, how's it going? 
living the dream, living the dream. Hey, following Jesus is the best life possible. Living the dream does not mean that you're going to have a yacht. It doesn't mean you're going to have a private jet. It doesn't mean you're going to have a house in the Hamptons. Hey, all those things are wonderful things, but that is not living the dream according to the will of God. Living the dream means that you will have a fulfilled and satisfied soul no matter what your surroundings might look like. Jesus promised life, but life more abundantly, <laughs> the best life possible. So today we're going to look at Psalm 126, and I believe that we're going to find some principles that can help us uh, have the right perspective when it comes to joy, when it comes to uh, the goodness of God uh, in our lives. And so today, if you're taking notes, I want to give us I want to give us three ways that we can infuse joy into our souls, that we can infuse joy into our souls and really live out the dream that God has for us today. Are you ready this morning? Yeah. Number one. If we're going to infuse joy into our souls, number one, consider what God has done. We have to pause and take inventory to have a spiritual audit and to consider all that God has done for us. Let's pick up the text in verse number one. I want to encourage you to keep your Bible ready today. Verse number one, it says this. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion. Now, that phrase, turned again the captivity of Zion, th this was a phrase of deliverance, that God turned, he turned their captivity into liberty. Uh, he set them free. Now, there are many times, if you study redemptive history, many times that God set his people free. We sang about it this morning uh, in Exodus, uh, how, how, how God set his uh, children free. Uh, also, we know that the children of Israel were in Babylonian captivity. After 70 years, God delivered them and set them free. Most commentators generally agree that this is when uh, the psalmist is talking about, that God uh, had set them free from this Babylonian captivity. Now, as this happened, two things happened. First, there was renewed joy. I want you to see in verse number two. There was renewed joy as they, as they reminisce about how God set them free. Notice verse number two. It says this. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. When they paused and considered the goodness of God, how God delivered them, uh, the natural byproduct of that was that they were filled with laughter and their, and their mouths were filled with singing. I love how the text says that their mouth was filled with laughter. Have you ever laughed so hard that it was hard to catch your breath? You know what I'm talking about when you just, when you just think something is so funny uh, that it's just hard for you to catch your breath. Uh, the other night, our family, we were playing this board game uh, that someone gave us called Throw Throw Burrito. Anybody ever play this game? Throw. Th it, it's an amazing game. If you haven't played it, essentially, I don't know how the card part works, but I know that if you get a certain card, you have to pick up a fake burrito and throw it at someone across the room. And so it's a genius game. Kudos to whoever invented it. Uh, my kids loved it. Uh, my son, Luke, we were playing Throw Throw Burrito, and he was laughing harder than I've ever seen him laugh before. I think just the thought of being able to throw a burrito at his sister with no consequences is like ultimate joy for a seven-year-old. And uh, he was just laughing hysterically. And uh, it was so fun to watch him laugh uh, that hard. And uh, my daughter, Blakely, she likes it when I, when I tickle her. And uh, sometimes I'll come in at night and uh, to tuck her in and uh, she'll just have her arms up like this. And I know what that means. She wants me uh, to tickle her. So I'll come in, I'll start tickling her and then she'll, uh, she'll be trying to catch her breath and she'll say, dad, stop, 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 stop. So then I'll stop and then she'll say, do it again. <laughs> and uh, she, she wants me to tickle her. And I just love listening to her uh, laugh. You know, there's something uh, good about laughter for your soul. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It's good for us to be filled with laughter and uh, filled with singing. Laughter is a gift from God. Now, when the children of Israel were in Babylonian captivity, they weren't laughing. When the children of Israel were in Babylonian captivity, they were weeping. They were mourning. In fact, uh, Psalm 137 gives us a little snapshot as to what this would look like. In Psalm 137, verse number one, it says this. By the rivers of Babylon, uh, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. In other words, they, they stopped singing. They hung up their harps. You know, I think the reality is today in 2022, many Christians have hung up their harps. They've lost their joy. Where there was once an excitement for the things of God or a heart or a passion for the things of God, now we've taken the harp, we've taken our song, and we've hung it up. We've missed out on joy. You know, the average child laughs about 300 times a day. The average adult laughs 17 times a day. So there's a dramatic and major decrease often in our joy. 
And here we see that the children of Israel at the prospect, the thought, the remembrance of when God delivered them out of captivity. Uh, we were like those that dream. We were filled with laughter and with singing. Uh, Charles Spurgeon said this, the mercy was so unexpected, so amazing, so singular that they could not do less than laugh. And they laughed much so that their mouths were full of it and that because their hearts were full too. Now today... Uh, do we have reason to laugh and to sing? We haven't, been, we haven't been set free from Babylonian captivity. We didn't have an angel deliver us out of prison like Peter. If you have, that's an amazing story. Please see me afterwards. I want to know more about that. Uh, we, we haven't had that experience like, like they had. So what is our reason to rejoice and to laugh and to sing? The Bible says this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, the word quickened means to be made alive, who were dead, in trespasses and sins. So we weren't just sick before Christ. We, just, we, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't just unfortunate before Christ. No, we were dead in our sins. Where in time past, your past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. So before Christ, this describes our lives that we were just walking according to our flesh, walking according to what we want to do and doing things according to our own strength, our own minds. And we're by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God. Is anybody thankful for those words today? That even though we were walking in our flesh, even though that we were dead in our sins, that we were without Christ, without God, without hope, without a future, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy. For his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together, made us alive together, by grace are you saved. And so, yes, we have reason to laugh today. Yes, we have reason to sing today. Yes, we have reason to pick up our harps again because he has loved us with a great love and he has saved us and redeemed us from our sin. And this is something that we have to constantly reminisce and remind ourselves and pinch ourselves that God has been so good to us. It's so easy to focus on the negative in life. It's so easy to focus on all the things that are going wrong in the world today, in the culture today. But every once in a while, pause and take spiritual inventory. Take a step back and just remember where you're going when you die if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. That we have a home in heaven. That we have a relationship with God. The children of Israel, they were laughing. They were singing. There was this renewed joy. But then also, there was also a ripple effect. I want you to see the ripple effect of their joy. Everybody still with me? Yes, Notice verse number two. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen. All right, everybody say the heathen. So the neighboring nations. Then said they among the heathen. The Lord hath done great things for them. And so because the children of Israel, they were laughing and singing, because they had joy, the neighboring nations were like, what's going on over there? Why is everybody laughing over there? They're supposed to be grumbling like us. They're supposed to be complaining like us. Uh, why, why do they have so much joy? Uh, man, God must have done some great things for them. See, because of their joy, because of their countenance and their disposition, they actually had a great effect on the lost people around them. You know, it's hard to reach the world. It's hard to reach the lost if we are constantly complaining to them. I hate my job. I hate my boss. I don't have any friends. My life is just, nobody gets me. Nobody understands me. By the way, you want to come to church with me next week? <laughs> just doesn't work that way, Right? And here what we see are the children of Israel. They're laughing. They're singing. God has been so good to us. And the neighboring nations are like, man, God must have done great things for them. They noticed that their, their testimony had a ripple effect. Uh, now, notice verse number three. I like how it continues on. Verse number three says this. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. And so I love how, how uh, the neighboring nations, they say, man, God must have done great things for them. And then the psalmist back in verse number three is like, God has done great. God hath done great things for us. You notice how they just repeat the exact same song? Uh, God has been so good to us, and so we're going to infuse joy uh, into our souls. By the way, uh, true joy is a decision before it's an emotion. And so it's not just a feeling that we just kind of manufacture or fake. No, no, true joy is a decision before it's an emotion. And so what we see is that uh, in this psalm of ascent, that they are considering what God has done, that he set us free, that he's delivered us. And as a result, they were filled with laughter and with singing. Now, this brings us to our next point. Number two today is this, ask God to do it again. So you consider what God has done. 
and then you ask God to do it again. Notice verse number four. It says this, turn again. Everybody say again. again. Turn again our captivity. In other words, the psalmist was so thankful for what God did in the past. God, thank you for setting us free. God, thank you for the deliverance of your people. God, we're so grateful for how you worked in the past. But God, we recognize that there is still work to be done. God, we are asking that you would continue to work in our presence, that you would continue to set the captives free, that there are still people that are lingering in Babylon that need to be uh, set free. God, we're asking that you would turn again our captivity, uh, that you would set us free once again. See, they considered what God had done, but then they were asking God to do more in their future. They were asking God to do it again. Now, uh, they were praying for uh, restoration. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce, he said this, For the psalmist, as for us, memory of the past could have become mere nostalgia. Uh, Those were the days, we say, wonderful but gone forever. In Psalm 126, the memory of those singing, laughter-filled days of the past becomes not nostalgia, uh, but the ground of a strong hope for even better days to come. And so as we consider the goodness of God, as we consider the power of God and how God has delivered us in the past, uh, that is the launching pad for asking God to do greater things in our future. So we're not just living in the past and just living in the glory days. Uh, If you remember uh, the movie from several years ago, Napoleon Dynamite. How many of you ever saw Napoleon Dynamite? All right, classic. And I remember Uncle Rico. Uncle Rico just living in the past, talking about his glory days of just playing football, being the star uh, quarterback, and how he had a big, big dreams for him, right? Uh, we did not have an Uncle Rico faith, okay, where we just kind of live in the past and the glory days. No, we look at what God has done in the past, and we ask God to do it again in our future. In other words, I'm so thankful, God, that you saved me. God, you redeemed my soul. Will you save my children? God, God, you delivered me and you set me free and gave me a home in heaven. Will you save my children? Will you save my grandchildren? God, I've seen you work in the past. I've seen you uh, set me free with my finances in the past. And you've provided for me time and time again in the past. And God, you know inflation is bad right now. And you know the gas prices are bad. God, 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 you know what's taking place in our economy. But I've seen you provide for me in the past. God, will you do it again? God, you provided this building for our church, and for that we are so thankful, and we are filled with gratitude for uh, providing us this space. But God, we're outgrowing two services, and God, we believe that you provided in the past and that you'll give us a permanent home for our future. Will you do it again? If you want to reinforce your prayer life, build your prayers based on what God has already done in the past. God, you delivered us, but we believe you can do it again. God, we're asking you to do more in our midst. This is what David did. David in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 37, David said, Moreover, the Lord hath that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. I remember when God delivered me from that lion. And out of the paw of the bear and the bear. And he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. How could David be so confident standing before a giant? Because he had seen God work in the past. And so today we have to consider what God has done but then we have to ask him to do it again in the future. So they said, turn again our captivity. But notice verse four goes on. Everybody still with me? Verse four goes on, it says this. It says, turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, as the streams in the south. Now, what the psalmist here is referring to is the Negev desert in southern Israel. This was a very dry place, a very barren place, not a whole lot happening uh, in this dry, uh, desert, barren place. But occasionally, on a very rare occasion, when it would rain, uh, because of the loose dirt, it would cause uh, flash floods. And all of a sudden, there would be streams in the south. This would be very sudden, very powerful, very dramatic. And so the psalmist is praying, God, would you work in that manner? Would you work in that fashion in my life? Uh, if you've ever been to Universal Studios, they have this, they have this back lot tour where you can kind of go behind the scenes and see how they film some of the shows and different things. And uh, one of the things that they show on that tour is you kind of go into this city and they, they manufacture, they produce this flash flood. How many of you have ever seen uh, what I'm talking about? I think we have a picture today, uh, perhaps. Uh, so we, th- you go into this city and you're kind of sitting on the tram. They have thousands of gallons of water kind of rushing in all, all at one moment. It's kind of, a, kind of a cool picture. It's a cool scene. And, and that is what the psalmist is praying for in Psalm 126 when he says, streams in the south. God, we're praying that you would rush in like a flash flood. God, we're praying that you would restore in a powerful, uh, dramatic way. God, would you bring refreshment into my life, into my soul? Derek Kinder said this, if the Lord sends rain, the desert can be transformed into a place of grass, 
flowers and fruit overnight. Hey, whatever battle you're facing today, whatever struggle you're facing today, nothing is too hard for the Lord. He can bring streams in the south. Identify a desert, barren place in your life. Maybe it's in your soul. I have not been spending time with God. You feel empty. You feel drained on the inside. It's a barren place. Perhaps it's your marriage. It's a dry place. The communication isn't flowing as it once did. Perhaps it's another relationship. Perhaps it's a relationship with family. I want to encourage you, identify a dry, barren place in your life, and then pray this prayer from Psalm 126, verse number four. God, I believe that you can bring streams in the south. Even in this desert, desolate, dry place, there is nothing too hard for you. And so uh, the psalmist was asking God to uh, do it again, to bring, to bring refreshment to his soul. Psalm 63, verse number 1 says this, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. We have to come to a a place of healthy desperation where we are longing for God to work and longing for God to bring streams in the south. And so today, we have to consider all that God has done. We have to ask him to do it again. And this leads us to our third thought today. You ready for number three? Number three is this. Keep sowing even when you're not seeing. Keep sowing even when you're not seeing. Now, the psalm closes by comparing the Christian life to that of a farmer, as the Bible often does. In that, that we are called to uh, sow the seeds of the gospel. Jesus put it this way in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 8, verse number 10. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. And Jesus was uh, talking to them why he was speaking in parables, and he was explaining the parable that he had just communicated. And he said this, now the parable is this, the seed, uh, the parable of the sower, the seed is the word of God. And so today, as we navigate our Christian lives, as we navigate following Jesus, we have to recognize that God has called us to sow gospel seeds everywhere we go in life, that we are to sow the seeds of the word of God and sow gospel seeds in our relationships and in our workplace and in our ministries, that we're to sow the right seeds. If you want a healthy soul, you have to sow the right seeds. And all of us today are sowing for a future reaping. Now, it doesn't matter if you are a follower of Jesus today or not. It doesn't matter if you uh, walked into this place and you have doubts and you're not even sure if you believe God. Uh, everyone, every human being is sowing for a future reaping. And we have to recognize and we have to take a look within. Am I sowing the gospel-centered seeds that I should be sowing? If you are a Christian today, am I sowing the right seeds into my marriage, into my family, into my, into my ministry? And as we consider that question, I want to close by giving us three principles about sowing. Would that be okay today? I want to communicate three things about sowing. First, sowing can be strenuous. Sowing can be strenuous. Now, notice our text in verse number five. It says this. They that sow in tears. Now, it almost seems like a stark contrast to what we've been talking about for the last few minutes, right? It's like filled with laughter and joy and singing and pinch me. I'm dreaming. This is amazing. And then he says, but you're going to sow in tears. And I believe that that there's not a contradiction here, there's not an incongruence here, uh, what we learn is that often great seasons of joy are preceded by seasons of tears. That following Jesus is never promised to be easy without sorrow, without suffering. He says you're going to sow, and you're going to sow in tears. Uh, by the way, uh, God knows all about our suffering. He's fully aware of our struggles. He's fully aware of our pain. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 56, verse number 8, Thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. That, that, that God is going to keep a record of our tears. That he's going to recognize and remember our sorrow. But here's what I want you to see today. Even when we are suffering, we are still called to sow. Did you see it in verse number 5? Notice verse number 5. He says, they that sow in tears. So the sorrow, the tears, did not provide an exemption to not have to sow. We're still required to sow even when we're hurting, even when we're struggling, even when we're not able to make sense of what's going on in our lives. God is still calling us to be responsible. God is still calling us to sow. In fact, 1 Peter 4 puts it this way. In 1 Peter 4, 19, he talks about in a season of suffering. He says, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing 
And so even when you are suffering according to the will of God, even when you are enduring a difficult season, you are still to commit your soul to well-doing unto a faithful creator. Here's what I want to communicate and encourage our church family. Even when you're hurting, keep on sowing. Even when you are struggling, keep on sowing. Even when you can't see, keep on sowing. For in due season, you will reap if you faint not. Don't give up. Keep on sowing. Keep on believing God for greater things in your marriage. Keep on believing God for greater things in your children. If you have a wayward child, keep on believing. Keep on sowing. If you have a friend or a family member or a neighbor that you are praying would come to know Jesus Christ and that they would get saved and be radically transformed by the gospel, keep on sowing those seeds. Even if you're not seeing any signs of fruit, keep on sowing. Sowing can be strenuous. He says, sow in tears. You know, often a farmer or gardener, they will steep their seeds in water, steep or soak their seeds in water to help with the germination process. In one commentator, he kind of used that thought, F.B. Meyer, and he said this, it is well when Christian workers steep their lessons in addresses with their prayers and tears. It is not enough to sow. We may do that lavishly and constantly, but we must add passion, emotion, tender pity, strong cryings and tears. In other words, when you sow into your children, don't just sow with barrenness. Sow with tears. Sow with passion. Soak those seeds with, with emotion and passion. When you are investing into your marriage, when you are investing into the local church, wherever you are sowing, uh, steep those seeds. Soak those seeds with passion and enthusiasm and with all your heart and soul. It requires sacrifice. And so sowing can be strenuous. But also, the second principle is sowing can be slow. Sowing can be slow. All right, let's, let's notice verse number six. He says in verse five, he says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. But then in verse six, he says, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, uh, that verse is encouraging, right? If you're going to go out and faithfully sow, God's going to faithfully supply. You're going to bring the sheaves in with you. It seems pretty self-explanatory. Any questions? Go out, sow in tears, bring in the sheaves. I have one question. When? Okay, I believe that God's going to provide. I believe that I can go out and sow and faithfully do what God wants me to do, and I'll bring in the sheaves. I'll, I'll have a great harvest season. I believe that God can do it. Don't you believe that God can do it today? When? See, the hardest part about sowing is waiting. I'm going to go and I'm going to serve faithfully. I know that there's going to be a harvest coming, but what happens when you sow for weeks and months and perhaps years and you're not seeing the harvest? Sowing can be strenuous, but sowing can be slow. And we're waiting on God to move. How many of you would say that you struggle with patience? Anybody like that? I know that I struggle with patience and, uh, and uh, having to wait on certain things. You know, I'm constantly trying to work on that. It's interesting because in this psalm, we see two pictures of blessing. Okay, in verse number four, we see, a, we see a fast picture of blessing. We see streams in the south. That was a sudden, that was a, that was a quick blessing. It was a flash flood of blessing, verse number four. But then we see verse number six, that we're called to go out and bear precious seed and weeping and there's gonna be tears and that's the slow blessing. A lot of times we want a verse four blessing when God wants us to have a verse six blessing. We want the flash flood. We want one prayer, one Sunday morning, all our problems are solved. Now, aren't you thankful? I believe that God can work like that. God can bring immediate healing. God can bring a flash flood of blessings into your life. But more often than not, God wants to grow us, stretch us, produce endurance within us, like James 1 uh, talks about. And, and so God wants us to sow, and sowing can be strenuous, sowing can be slow, but here's the third principle about sowing. So, sowing always leads to satisfaction. When we're sowing the right seeds, when we're sowing uh, the gospel uh, seeds, sowing always brings satisfaction because at the end of verse number six, he says, rejoicing, rejoicing. I'm so thankful that when we are faithfully sowing, God is faithfully supplying, that God is going to bring the satisfaction that we so often desire. You know, a lot of times we're searching for satisfaction in life, but we're searching in all the wrong places. 
We want some sense of fulfillment. We want some sense of satisfaction. And we're searching and we're constantly searching. You know, my dog, uh, I have a dog named Gunner. And uh, anytime uh, we leave any food out, he's constantly searching. And sometimes we'll come down the stairs and he's searching everywhere. And, uh, and uh, he'll dig into the trash can sometimes. And we know, uh, Gunner, one thing about him is he has a very guilty conscience. And, uh, and uh, if he gets caught, he's very guilty looking. I think I have a picture of Gunner this morning. This is, I, I walk down the stairs and he just knew. I didn't have to say anything. I just looked at him and he just felt so guilty. And don't say, aw, he was doing something wrong, okay? He, he, he needed to be in trouble. And <laughs> sin. So Gunner was guilty. A couple years ago, I, I walked down the stairs and I could hear Gunner doing some, uh, doing some wrong things. I could hear him just getting in the trash. And, and uh, I walked over and I saw this Gunner. That's a bag of crazy bread from Little Caesars that he found his head in and he got stuck in there. And so we left it on for a little while to teach him a lesson. No, I'm just kidding. We, we took it off. You know, so often in life, if we're honest, if we take a look within, we're busy going through life searching for the next best thing. I'm searching for satisfaction, so I need a new relationship. I need a raise. I need more money. I need new relationships. I need a better job, and we're constantly going to and fro, trying to find something that's gonna give us that satisfaction. But if you are serious about eternal satisfaction for your soul, you have to go to Jesus Christ because he is the living water. And one stop with the well of Jesus Christ, the living water, you will never be thirsty again. And so we don't have to go to and fro in life and looking everywhere, trying to find inner fulfillment, trying to find satisfaction. We can go to Jesus. Now, as we consider this passage in Psalm 126, really, it points us ahead to Jesus. As we consider these seeds that we're to be sowing, and we consider this principle of sowing and reaping, there's no greater example than that of Jesus. The Bible says this in John 12, verse number 24. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die... It bringeth forth much fruit. What looks like something where it is buried is actually planted. He says, if it dies, it'll bring forth much fruit. Jesus is the seed. Jesus is the seed that was prophesied all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. The seed of the woman that would crush the head of the serpent. Jesus is the seed that would be buried in Joseph's tomb. Jesus is the seed that would go into the ground, but aren't you thankful Jesus is the seed that three days later would rise again and would defeat sin, death, and the grave so that we could live on forever. Jesus sowed the tears of the, of the crucifixion so that we could reap the joy of the resurrection. And today, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, today can be the day of salvation for you. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again. Everybody say born again. We all have a physical birth. It's on our birth certificate. That date, we know when we were born physically. But have you been born again into the family of God? Today, this morning, in the room online, do you have a spiritual birth? Has there been a time, a day, a moment when you invited Christ into your life and accepted that free gift of salvation and been welcomed into the family of God? He says being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. It's not just about man's ideas and philosophies and arguments and reasonings and no, no, no. It's about the living word of God that will stay alive forever. We can be born again by the incorruptible seed. And this is what it really all boils down to. The Bible says in Mark 8, verse number 36, this is the last verse that I'll read. In fact, you can join me in standing this morning. It says in Mark 8, verse number 36, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world, lose his own soul? What does it matter if we have the greatest income, if we have a giant yacht, a private jet, we have all the success that the world has to offer. What does it profit a man if he loses his own soul? Today, the good news of the gospel is that you can be saved. 
You can be set free. You can be forgiven of your sins. You can be eternally satisfied through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And for those reasons, we have reason to rejoice. We can pinch ourselves. I must be dreaming. God has been so good to me. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes today.